Hello and welcome to the sixth installment of our webinar series, Art and Architecture with Kurt DiCamillo. My name is Ginevra Morse. I manage the events and programs here at American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society. I will be your moderator and virtual MC for today's event. American Ancestors is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We are the oldest and largest genealogical organization in the country. We specialize in providing resources, research, and expertise that uncover the stories of families, family objects, and family homes. We are pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. In today's session, Kurt DiCamillo will illuminate the many ways in which 19th century London gave birth to the modern world. Over the next hour, we will meet several indelible characters, be swept away by Kurt's stories that weave together the arts, history, and humor. And by the end, we should all have a greater appreciation for how 19th century London continues to influence our lives today. If you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the question panel at any point during the presentation. We will answer as many as we can at the end. And I also want to note that we are broadcasting from our homes to yours with various limitations and distractions. We apologize in advance if there are any interruptions from our end, and we thank you for your patience. And even if we were to lose the connection, uh, you will still have access to a full recording of this presentation on our website. And giving this presentation is Kurt D. Camillo, an internationally recognized authority on English country houses and the decorative arts. Kurt joined American Ancestors in February of 2016 as our first curator of special collections. A longtime member of American Ancestors, Kurt has led highly successful heritage tours for our organization to England, Scotland, and Italy. He's lectured extensively in the United States and abroad and has taught classes on British culture and art at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Kurt was previously executive director of the National Trust for Scotland Foundation USA as, and as curator of uh, special collections here at American Ancestors, Kurt provides strategic direction and expert guidance for organizing and exhibiting our extensive collection of family history related artifacts. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Kurt D. Camillo. Thank you all so much for joining me on today. Um, I have to say that it's striking that it's been 19 years since 9-11, and I feel like we have to acknowledge that this afternoon. Um, it was gray and dark and depressing here all day in Boston, even though they were predicting sun. And about half an hour ago, the sun came out, brilliant sun. And I have to believe this is a sign that we have happier times ahead. And I know there are all kinds of rumors about what people do when they're giving you these remote lectures like I'm doing right now. Um, and I want to assure you that I am indeed wearing pants. Well, probably. Um, so I have to talk a little bit about Boston because of course Boston is where I live and it's important for those of you who don't know that Oliver Wilmer Holmes in the 1870s called Boston the hub of the universe. And this is still something that sticks today with us in Boston. So it's hard for me to admit that London is more important, but of course it is. And there have been thousands of years of history in London, but I'm gonna start with us today talking about Roman London, which of course was called Londinium. This was um, the beginning of what we have real recorded history here. And it's funny because we think of London as this cosmopolitan center. It was just a provincial outpost when the Romans came here in the first century AD. Um, although they did bring Roman culture to the island of Britain. They're the ones, of course, that named it Britain. They're the ones, of course, that called it Londinium. And in 1834, there was this massive head of the Emperor Hadrian found in the Thames probably a second century AD, you're looking at it right here, it's in the British Museum today. And um, this was probably part of, of a larger than life statue of the emperor and was very likely unveiled in Londinium when the emperor came to begin the construction of the famous Hadrian's Wall to separate what was in the civilized world, which was England from the non-civilized world, which was Scotland. Although those names of course didn't exist then. 
This is an astonishing thing for us, I think in America particularly, to think of that you have these Roman ruins just cropping up. But what's to me just as interesting is that, as I say, London was just a little provincial outpost. The capital, the provincial capital of Roman Britain was a city that still exists today in Essex called Colchester. And you can see here an artist rendering of what um, their own version of the um, Colosseum looked like. And I, I want to encourage you to look around all those lovely tiled red roofs. Very, very Roman. And this is interesting because this is Britain. <laughs> this is not what we think of. We don't think of the Mediterranean, which is what this picture gives us. But we know that Britain was an inexpensive place for Romans to retire. It was expensive to live in Italy. So they would come here and retire. They could, their money would go further. And they created miniature Romes all around here. As a matter of fact, in early 2000, I think in two, they discovered in Colchester the remains of a track where they did chariot races. So just sort of picture Ben-Hur. And all of this, of course, comes under the great guise of the Roman Empire, which is something that um, you still see remnants of when you go to Rome today. The symbol of the city is this, SPQR, which is Latin for the, the Senate and the people of the Roman Republic, something that Rome put where ever its empire went. And Britain, of course, by the 18th century, certainly saw itself as the new Rome. And its little slogan, instead of SPQR, was the sun never sets on the British Empire, which, of course, was true. The sun was always shining. It was the largest empire ever known in world history. It still remains that way today. And I love this next slide. This is the 1930s board game called The Game <laughs> of the British Empire or trading with the colonies. And why I like this particularly is because of the image you see there on the left of Britannia. Now, Britannia was an image that the Romans gave to their province, but she was based on probably Athena, but more likely based on the ancient Roman idea of Roma, a female warrior who was the symbol of the Roman Empire. And this is something that Britain, certainly in its empire days in the 19th century, adopted as a symbol, and it's still all over Britain. And we'll see signs of that later on today. Those of you like me who grew up in the 1960s and 70s remember all these things of the, the wonderful fog of the London town. Well, it is a foggy place by nature, but it was so polluted by the 19th century um, that it was a very unhealthy place to live. This was the first city in the world that was documented to have more than one million people living in it. And that, of course, happened in the 19th century. And it, it got worse and worse. Those of you who watched um, the TV series The Crown will remember in the 1950s when Winston Churchill um, refused to accept the fact that pollution was causing this fog and thousands of people died by getting hit by getting their lungs filled with pollution. So what we think of, like with Sherlock Holmes and foggy streets in London town, mostly a product of man. Um, something else that I think is a product of man, well, I know is a product of man, is a cluttered interior. And in this next photograph, which shows you Queen Victoria in her drawing room at Windsor Castle, I have to have an arrow to point out to you where the queen is because there is so much clutter here. This is very much the 19th century. This idea of Victorian clutter, of course, came about because of Victoria's reign. And the whole idea of this much stuff in a room is almost entirely 19th century English conceit. What I love about this picture as well is you see her here with her youngest daughter, Princess Beatrice, who, because she was the youngest, was not allowed to marry. Her job in life was to be her mother's companion. She was finally allowed to marry when she when she was quite beyond marriageable age. Um, and she was rather bitter at her mother for making her be her companion without any money, of course. She wasn't a paid companion. So the highlight of Victoria's reign was her jubilee service in 1897. She was the first British monarch ever to reign for 60 years. And her diamond jubilee, which of course celebrated that, was sort of the culmination of all this. And you can see her here where that yellow arrow is in her carriage approaching St. Paul's Cathedral. You can also see to the left the temporary stands that were built to accommodate all the spectators. And then you can see in the foreground all the Indian soldiers because, of course, 
the crown, the jewel in the crown was India, the colony that made the most money for the empire. And Victoria was unusual. She had her prejudices, but one of them that she didn't have, she did not have a prejudice against people of color, and she employed an awful lot of Indians in her personal household. She was also the first monarch to make her official London home in this house, a house that looked like this in the 18th century and by the early 19th century because of the efforts of her uncle, King George IV, had morphed into this Buckingham Palace. George IV believed that London did not have an appropriate palace grand enough for its empire, nowhere near anything that existed in France. And France, of course, didn't even have the sense of monarchy that Britain did. So he commissioned this gargantuan expansion of what was originally Buckingham House, the seat of the Duke of Buckingham, into this big palace. He didn't live to see it completed. Victoria was the very first monarch to live here. She moved in in 1837 and found it, shockingly, not big enough. So she put a wing on that actually linked those two little projections coming out there in the left and right. There you see it right there. This is from an 1850s photograph. Um, this is still there today. It's been remodeled in the early 20th century to give it more of a French classical look. But basically, the front with the famous balcony, that's all a creation of Victoria. And so much of what we think of as being central to the monarchy, which is Buckingham Palace, is entirely a 19th century creation. And even though Parliament in London is called the mother of parliaments, the building itself is quite new. You see here a very famous painting by Turner of the burning of the Houses of Parliament in 1834, um, today in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. This painting shows you the destruction of what was surprisingly unimpressive premises. And because of that, there was an enormous competition to build a new seat of government that was worthy of the world's largest empire. And that, of course, is what we got today, which is called officially the Palace of Westminster, designed by Charles Barry. The, once again, something that seems, I think, particularly to we Americans, is something that's been here forever. And it really was only finished in 1870. Ironically enough, for those of you who watch Downton Abbey, um, the same architect did Highclere Castle, and you can see very clearly the architectural relation between these two buildings, Highclere sort of a miniature version of the Houses of Parliament. And of course, that was no accident because the Houses of Parliament from the day of its unveiling was so successful that people all around the world wanted to emulate it, even in their houses. It's shocking to think that the Romans, when they had Londinium, actually had a sewer system in place, and it was almost a thousand years before it came back. And because London was so polluted and because people did what you see here, which is no sewers, you just took your chamber pot and threw it out the window. And if you had an unsuspecting man knocking on your door, he got you know what in the face. The disease was astonishing, the cholera particularly. Um, the Thames was so smelly that no one wanted to live near it. It was an open sewer. And you had this incredible project to build a proper sewer system, which is still used today. And as part of that, we had the production of the world's flush, the first flush toilets. And you see here a Royal Dalton. I mean, everybody should have a Royal Dalton blue and white porcelain flush toilet. This one came up at auction here in Boston at Skinner. So you can still buy these. And if you have a lot of money, you can convert this into a proper low flush toilet. <laughs> Poverty was always a big problem in London. I mean, for centuries. It got to um, close to a head in the 18th century. This is a famous detail from an engraving by Hogarth called Gin Lane. Um, this is a woman who is addicted to drink and is so drunk on gin that she has tossed her baby probably to his death overboard, not even realizing that she's doing this. Gin, interestingly enough, very much considered an English drink today, was actually imported from Holland. So there was a lot of resentment against the Dutch for bringing in this disease <laughs> called gin. By the 19th century, poverty was even more rampant, particularly among the urban poor. And you see a perfect example of that here with these two boys. Um, they did not own shoes ever. So what you see became such a big problem. There were cries in parliament for reform to make sure that children didn't die. And it, out of all this that we, in 1865, 
was founded the Salvation Army. The Salvation Army was originally founded to help children. It's over the years morphed into helping people at large, but because of the extreme poverty of children in London, um, the Salvation Army was just one of many outgrowths to deal with excessive poverty. We also have, of course, the first documented serial killer in London in the 19th century, the famous Jack the Ripper. Um, his fame certainly spread because he happened to occur in the time of illustrated newspapers, which got the word out. There probably were serial killers before, but this man still sticks with us, all kinds of reasons. He only, I say only, he only killed 11 people. Um, they've never been solved. There are over 100 theories as to who this person was. The one that seems to get the most traction, although without any evidence, is that it was the Duke of Clarence who was um, the grandson of Queen Victoria. All kinds of weird suspicions come up. You know how it is when people get conspiracies in their minds. It's interesting and just coincidental that at the same time, a year before the murders in Jack the Ripper started, we had in 1887 the appearance of this, the first book that came out with a private detective, which was something else. It was a, a modern invention of 19th century London. And this was called A Study in Scarlet. This is an illustration from the very first edition. And of course, that man was Sherlock Holmes. And even though I think Benedict Cumberbatch is divine and the new Sherlock is fantastic, all due respect to Benedict, hot as he is, really and truly Jeremy Brett, for my money, is the best Sherlock Holmes. Um, he's no longer with us, but in the 1980s and 90s, he produced what I think is the definitive portrayal of Sherlock Holmes. I saw him interviewed once where he said he went to Conan Doyle's daughter, who was still alive, and talked to her before he interpreted this character that he created. And the whole idea of private detectives all started here in 19th century London. Something else that started in 19th century London is time. Obviously time has existed for thousands of years, but before the 19th century, every town had its own time, usually just set by the local church's clock or a big building that had a clock on it. And that time was set by the sun. There was no reason for one town or one village or one city to have the same time as the one next to it. It was only the coming of the railroads in the early 19th century that required everybody to have a standard time so that the railroad could keep a timetable and it would be the same time in each city that the train went to. And that grew. And by the end of the 19th century, there was this call to have a worldwide time. And that all focused on Greenwich, the section of London called Greenwich, specifically at the Royal Observatory, which you see an 18th century engraving of here. This was founded by Charles II. It was designed, the building you see in front of you, by Christopher Wren. It's no longer an observatory, it's now a museum. But it was here that time began. This was the zero meridian. And they used to actually have in the pavement in front of the Royal Observatory, a piece of brass that was the zero meridian, that was the beginning of time. What they've done since the early 2000s instead is this big, honking green laser beam that shows you the zero meridian. What I love about this is that all the major countries of the world agreed that this would be the new time, that time would start in London, except for one. Now, if I was in front of you guys in person, I would ask you to tell me what country that was. But since I can't hear you, I'm gonna tell you it was France. Of course, it was the French. They refused to, <laughs> they refused to adopt. British time because it was British. So for decades, they kept their own meridian in Paris that was different than anybody else's. Oye vey, the French. So now, transportation, modern transportation as we know it today, public transportation started in London in the early 19th century. There were stagecoaches, of course, before this, but a stagecoach was a passage that had to be booked in advance. It had a maximum of maybe six people that could be carried inside and out. An omnibus is what you see here, which is basically a bus drawn by horses. Anybody could get on. You could hold up to 20 people. 
You didn't have to have a reservation and you'd be dropped anywhere between the two starting points and ending points. And this led eventually in the 1850s to the founding of the London General Omnibus Company, which was hugely influential in creating all kinds of mass transit. They were the first mass producers of electric diesel powered, gasoline powered buses. And you see the very first double decker bus in 1910 that was introduced by them um, in that ubiquitous red. They built these themselves, amazingly enough. And these were in operation until the 1950s and they were replaced by the most famous of the buses, the AEC Routemaster, which you see here, which is, I think, the quintessential London double-decker bus. It was in service until 2005. It just has perfect lines. It was tight. It could take all kinds of people. From, it was just astonishing. In the old days, before electronic cars, you actually got in, you sat down, someone came up to you, and he had a little device on his waist, and he would turn out with a handle, a little receipt, and take money from you. It was just so cool. We can't talk about transportation in 19th century London and not talk about the man who dominated the scene more than anybody. This man, Isambard Kingdom Brunel, he was one of the most important people in the Industrial Revolution. He was a genius, but particularly regarding transport. He was one of the founders of the Great Western Railway. He really created modern engineering and modern transportation as we think of it today. But the reason I'm here specifically is to talk about his ship. He did more than one ship, but he was the man that did the first propeller-driven ship in the world, and you're looking at it right here. The SS Great Britain. This is the first photograph ever known taken of a ship in 1844. And I say the first propeller. It was not the first propeller. It was the first ironclad propeller-driven ship that crossed the Atlantic. And when it came out, it was the largest ship in the world. I have to say something about the man who took this photograph. This is a small sidebar, but we can't leave without talking about William Henry Fox Talbot. He was one of the greatest figures as well. He basically invented photography, in addition to being a classicist, a physicist, and a transcriber of Syrian cuneiform text. In 1835, he created the very first photographic negative, and that's why he's today called the father of modern medicine. And of course, you can imagine me with my background in British houses, how tickled pink I am that the very first photograph in the world is of an English country house, more specifically of Fox Talbot's house, Laycock Abbey in Wiltshire, which is today owned by the National Trust. This is it. This is the photograph. This is of an oriel window in his house. I bought this on eBay. This, of course, is not the original. This is something somebody was selling. Um, but there's a whole museum at Laycock to him and to the founding of photography. And I really recommend if you get a chance to go to Wiltshire. It's a gorgeous part of the world. Now, back to our ship, because the ship is wicked cool. Um, you have to look at all the things going on here. Largest ship in the world, the first one that crossed the Atlantic on regular time, the first one that used screw propellers in the transatlantic. And I have here two arrows to show you proportion and scale. So you see here on the bottom right, that's a man clearly, <laughs> to show you the proportion of how big that screw is. The screw is what they call the propeller. And what's amazing about this is that it still exists. This is the original ship today, and it is in dry dock in Bristol, England in the same dry dock in which she was built. She's now a museum. And if you look at the top arrow, that's a piece of glass that simulates the top of the water level. And in the next slide, you can see this all coming together. You can actually see where that arrow on the left is, that red arrow, that is the piece of glass we saw from the underside. And this is the ship. She's an amazing museum. I have to say, she doesn't look that spectacular right now as ships go. But what she did was amazing. You can see she's also outfitted for sales because the technology was still a little unsure. You wanted to make sure you had a backup so you could use sails in case the engines didn't work. What made her groundbreaking besides her speed and the fact that she crossed the Atlantic was her luxury. And you can see in this next slide, she was the very first ocean liner to have nice interiors. They didn't really even have dining rooms before. You're looking here at the first class dining room. 
if you crossed the Atlantic before this, you even if you were rich and paid a lot of money, you basically had a hammock. And if you were really rich, you could have a hammock in your own little section. Usually you were in there with nine or 10 other people. This is the beginning of modern transatlantic travel that was actually nice enough that you didn't get sick every day. And it was from this that we have the birth of the modern ocean liner. We would not, in my opinion, have something as beautiful as the Queen Elizabeth II without having the SS Great Britain. This to me is one of the most beautiful ships ever built. Um, not like these disgusting monstrosities that are called cruise ships today, like they're just, ugh. this is such an elegant ship, my God, it's just perfect, perfect. So to talk about transportation, it's also important to talk about something that originated in London as well, which was a subway. Of course, this is a very famous snip of the London Underground map. It was the world's first subway. It began in 1863. It has 270 stations, 250 miles of tracks, and carries 1.3 billion passengers per year. That just blows my mind. But you put that, the underground, together what was going on on top of the ground at the same time, which was, of course, the railroad. Railroads really hit their stride in 19th century London more than any other city in the world. And this famous painting called the railway station that was done in 1866 gives you, I think, a very good idea of the Victorian idea of railroad stations. And London embraced the railroad like no other city in the world and with grandeur as well. In this next slide, you'll see the exterior of Waterloo Station. That arrow of course is pointing to a statue of Britannia who I talked to you about earlier. Um, this station was opened in 1848. It serves 100 million passengers a year. But what's more amazing to me is that London has 18 train stations. I can't think of any city in the United States that has more than two. And you're looking at just the 10 largest here. There are eight more. And these stations collectively serve 500 million passengers a year. So to put this in perspective, New York has about the same population as London. And New York has two major train stations. The first inner city train station in England was Euston Station, which was opened in 1837. And it has the largest propyleum ever built, which is sort of that, that opening arch there that you went through to get to the station. It was an amazing tour de force. If you went into the lobby, it was famous for its murals. It had a great hall that was 126 feet long, 61 feet wide, and 64 feet high. It was, an, it was sort of, sort of a, a pan to art. And in 1961, the year I was born, it began to be torn down. And what you see here was replaced in 1968 by this, which is just, as far as I'm concerned, a monstrosity. This is um, Houston Station today. And to give you an exterior view, this is the great arch. And the arch alone, they tried to save just the arch, and they, even that couldn't be saved. Um, this is the famous Houston Arch in the 1890s, and this is the same view today. Um, entirely unimpressive. I mean, there really isn't anything good to say about 1960s architecture. One of the few things that was saved from the station were the gates that were at the base of the prop lane, which you see an arrow pointing to them here. And the gates are today in the National Railway Museum in New York. For those of you who love trains, I cannot say enough about the National Railway Museum. It is just goosebump material. It's so cool. It's got the best of British rails inside there. Just amazing. So of course I said there were lots of stations, 18 in London, um, and all of them weren't torn down. What you see here in front of you is St. Pancras, and it's built in a style called Ruskinian Gothic, which you can sort of see a little bit out here. It's red brick, lots of color, lots of different colored stones, all influenced by Venice. Um, if you look to the right, the big piece going way to the back, that was the station itself. The piece in front with the tower, that was built to be a hotel. Almost all these great stations had hotels attached to them for obvious reasons. And this was going to be pulled down in the 1960s because it was considered a Victorian monstrosity. Um, thankfully, it was saved. For most of my life, it was just there. It was still a, a train station, but the hotel had been abandoned. 
it had nothing going on it. You could get secret tours once a year of the falling down interiors. And it wasn't until 2000 that they made the decision to really save it. And that was when it was converted into St. Pancras International, which was the beginning of Eurostar. So this is where trains leave for the continent. And they spent $1 billion converting it into this high powered station. You can see that when it opened in 1868, this train shed that you're looking at here, um, which has a width of 245 feet, was the largest um, single span roof in the world. It is an astonishing building. It's now a hotel again. Um, and it just, it's, it's just worth work walking up to it. Um, it's, it's right across the street from King's Cross, right to the right. Um, and it just, King's Cross is just, ugh, St. Pancras is divine. Let's talk about some of the people who made this world. This is Joseph Aloysius Hansen. He was a Yorkshire architect. He founded a journal called The Builder in 1843, which astonishingly enough still exists today. Um, it is sort of the architectural magazine of record in Britain. He was a man you don't hear about unless you're really into British architects, um, but he was very talented. He could design in all kinds of styles. If you look here at the Birmingham Town Hall, you can see he did a very competent classical style. If that's not what you wanted, he was very, very good at Gothic. You could go, as you see here, um, at the Church of the Holy Name of Jesus in Manchester, the Catholic Church. He designed this in the Gothic style. But the reason he's important to us, what he's handed down to us, besides being a good architect, was an invention, something that most of us are aware of but may not know about, certainly not the man behind it, and that is the handsome cab that he patented in 1834. This was important for all kinds of reasons. Um, it's been in almost every single Sherlock Holmes TV show or movie ever made. What made it important was its agility. You can see here, you have the driver behind, it could hold two people and it had one horse. It had a very low center of gravity, which meant that it could take very tight turns very quickly without turning over. It also could get in and out of traffic jams very easily in London, which 19th century traffic jams were notorious in London. And instead of having a great carriage with two or four horses, this guy could get you in and out really fast. At its height in the late 19th century, there were 7,500 of these just in London. They spread all around the great cities of the British Empire. Um, they went to Paris and Berlin and St. Petersburg, and they were particularly popular in New York City. You could very easily walk into an Edith Wharton story and she would feel like she was right at home as she walked into a handsome cab. Very much a part of what we think of when we think of 19th century London is Victorian art. And this is a painter who's been pretty much forgotten, Arthur Hacker. This painting he did in 1896 called The Cloister or the World um, won the picture of the year of the Royal Academy year it was painted and it shows you a very very constant theme throughout Victorian society which is temptation so you have this nun kneeling here and over to her right is an angel of the Annunciation which is where she should be going and behind her on the right is this dancing figure who's very sensuous which is the temptation of the flesh this is very much the idea that the Victorians had that art should be morally inspiring, it should take you on the right path of life. So a reaction against that were the pre-Raphaelites who were hugely influential and they actually called themselves the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. And even though it was a combination of writers and artists, we think of them today primarily as representing art. And they called themselves the Pre-Raphaelite because they wanted to take the painting styles back to the time before Raphael. They believed that after Raphael, art had become degenerated. They were particularly um, ill, that <laughs> they didn't like Sir Joshua Reynolds, who was the first president of the Royal Academy and who in the 18th century was a god in British art circles. They called him Sir Slashua. And instead of his kind of very formal stiff paintings, they like this that you see here on the right, this Rossetti, um, very sensuous, very real, and not necessarily always talking about history. So a man that was key to all of this was Millet, John Everett Millet, who you see here, who was the youngest person ever admitted to the Royal Academy schools when he was admitted at the age of 11. 
usually you had to be 18. The Brotherhood was founded at his house in London. His wife was formerly married to John Ruskin, um, who had been an early supporter of Millet's work. Not surprisingly, <laughs> Ruskin was not a supporter after his wife left him for Millet. Of course, it should be said that he was married to her for seven years and never consummated the marriage. So yeah, okay, all kinds of stuff going on there. Now, what's interesting is that certainly when I was growing up, Millet was considered this disgusting Victorian artist who was very, very sentimental, dripping with morality. And he had fallen tremendously out of favor. And this is a perfect example of which the late, 19th, late 20th century revolted against this moralistic tale that he would do, the blonde girl that you see here, um, that was something that, that they considered to be too saccharine, um, talking down to the public. And the fact that, that Millet is stressing the girl's Madonna-like calm, even though she's homeless, and that she has the idea of divine promise and the rainbow. Um, these were things that you can imagine became very cloying, particularly after World War II. What he's most famous for today, which is in the Tate Britain, which people come from all over the world to see, is his very famous painting of Ophelia as she attempts to, like she does successfully kill herself. Um, this is one of the iconic 19th century images. And because it's so sad, I think I have to sort of give you a nicer version of that because it involves a cat. And you can see here the other version of Ophelia she looks much happier here. <laughs> the cat isn't dying, she's just smiling. She's having a little lazy time going down the river. We can't talk about 19th century British art and not talk about Lord Leighton, who you see here. Um, hugely successful in his own time. He was the very first artist in British history to be made a lord. He also holds the title to this day of the shortest peerage in British history. He died one day after being made a lord. He's most famous for his history paintings. And you can see in this next one, Icarus and Daedalus. Um, he loved ancient tales. He loved bright, bright colors. He was also very, very good at sculpture, something you don't find with a lot of painters. This is his athlete wrestling a python, which is also at Tate Britain. Um, he was sort of hailed as a renaissance in English sculpture when he started debuting this in the late 19th century. He also had a softer side. Here in Boston at the Museum of Fine Arts, we have um, the painter's honeymoon that he did. This is one of the most popular paintings actually in the museum. And it's interesting because um, Lord Leighton never married. He liked to surround himself with young men. And um, he was supposedly the model for Professor Higgins in A My Fair Lady, or if you think back to Pygmalion, um, because he thought women were good for models, and that was pretty much it. Um, he was so successful, though, that he built a house in London, which still stands, which is now a museum called Leighton House, not surprisingly. And I have an arrow there on the left pointing to that dome. This is a house that is surprising because on the outside, it's, you know, it's a red brick house. So it's not that spectacular. When you walk inside, it blows you away. Um, this is the entrance hall, which he called the Arab Hall. This has thousands of 14th and 15th century tiles that he brought back from Damascus and had installed here. And if you turn and put your back to the staircase, and look in the other direction, you can see the dome that we saw from the outside. There is no interior in London like this. Um, it was so exotic. It was so fashion forward. It's just an amazing amalgam. And it, as I say, he was very successful in his own lifetime, which most artists aren't. And he was able to use that money to build this house, which interestingly enough has one bedroom in it <laughs> for him. So I mentioned earlier about John Ruskin, and we have to talk about Ruskin a bit more because he was sort of the glue that held all this together. Um, 19th century art, 19th century social improvement and writing. He wrote about everything, about architecture, about geology, botany, Greek myths. He was hugely, hugely critical of what he considered to be mass poverty in England. He believed in environmentalism and he was the man 
who really promoted the pre-Raphaelites. His very first successful book was called Modern Painters, which came out in 1843. And in it, he had two main focuses, which is one, the pre-Raphaelite painters. Now, let's not forget, when this was done, they were modern art. They were not by any stretch of imagination considered acceptable by most of society. And his second big focus on this was Turner. He believed that what these painters did, Turner and the Pre-Raphaelites, was that they allowed themselves to be influenced by nature and that art is truth to nature. And he took that even further because he believed that art should be taught in a formal school. So in this time and for everything before that, you couldn't go to one of the great universities, Oxford or Cambridge, and get a degree in art. It wasn't considered a proper profession. He was the very first professor of art at Oxford, and they named a university school after him, which is today called the Ruskin School of Art. That was the degree of his influence. But his number one champion in life, the man he really brought to the fore and made an astonishing success, was Turner. J.M.W. Turner, Joseph Mallard, William Turner here in a self-portrait when he was actually quite young and thin, um, as we all once were. Turner is unique. Nobody else in artistic history in any country painted like Turner. And in this next slide, you can see one of his most famous paintings, The Slave Ship, which is here in Boston at the MFA. Um, this style, the beginning of Impressionism had never been done before. Nobody had ever painted like this. Now this has a particular message as painting. He was very much, Turner was very much um, against slavery. And this is actually telling a story and it's meant to be slightly veiled so you're not offended by what's going on here, but I'll tell you what's going on. Slaves were insured when they were being transported from one country to another for death, but they were not insured if they die from disease, but they were insured if they fell overboard during a storm. So what would invariably happen is that captains would have sick and dying slaves and they would wait until there was a storm and then they would put irons on them and throw them overboard so they would drown so they could claim the insurance money. And that's what you see going on here. If you look closely in the foreground, you can see hands and legs, you can see chains um, on the right, you can see sort of a scary version of a sea monster probably a whale coming and eating these bodies floating in the water. Um, Turner painted this specifically for Prince Albert, Queen Victoria's husband, to see at an international conference in 1840 um, to discuss the abolition of slavery in the world. It had been abolished in the British Empire, but of course it was still going on all around the rest of the world, certainly in the United States. And he wanted Prince Albert to see this so that he would realize how horrible the slave trade was. But now take this, in your mind's eye, and then look at this painting from Monet. I don't think you would have this without Turner. Like so much else in life, we all stand on the soldiers of those who went before us. And I think Monet has a debt to Turner. And I also think one of my favorite painters, um, Frank Vincent, an American, part of the um, Boston Impressionist School, has a debt to Monet. This is his painting called Summer of his daughters in Penobscot Bay in Maine, 1909. This is to me just a perfect evocation of a lovely New England summer. So a man who talks a lot about Turner is Kenneth Clark. And I want to stop here for just a few minutes and talk more about him, the man himself. Kenneth Clark was the youngest director of the National Gallery. He was later the keeper of the King's Pictures. In this photograph on the left, in the far background, you can see him standing in front of um, Fountains Abbey in Yorkshire. The reason we're really here talking about him is his 1969 documentary, Civilization, which is really groundbreaking. It was um, 13 episodes, about an hour each, took three years to film all around the world. Nothing like it had ever been done before. Um, I think that it is breathtaking. I was re-watching some of the episodes the last week to sort of prepare for this lecture today. And though I, I own the DVDs of the episodes, and I also have the book, there was a book that was published in 1969 to go with the TV series, and the book has never gone out of print. 
I have to say that this is the most erudite, most compelling story of art and civilization I have ever seen put together. It's one of the most amazing things put on film. And I'm not using superlatives when I tell you that most people believe that the modern documentary started here in 1969 with this. He was an astonishing ability to grasp all these threads of history and pull them together. He said that, and I'm quoting directly from him, by far the greatest painter England has ever produced is Turner. And he believed he being Kenneth Clark, that this painting, Rain, Steam, and Speed, the Great Western Railway, railway founded, of course, by Brunel, is one of the most important paintings ever produced. There are all kinds of reasons for that where I won't go into, but we can all agree that art is an individual choice. So I said to you we would get back to Ruskinian and Gothic, because I think this is an important thing that has influences around the world, particularly in America. Um, it's often, oftentimes called High Victorian Gothic. It was particularly used in the United States um, for university buildings. And all of this was based on a book that was written by Ruskin in the 1850s called The Stones of Venice, because Ruskinian Gothic was basically all about Venice and the architecture of Venice. And you can see a recent version of the Stones of Venice, which has actually never gone out of print um, since it first came out in 1851. You can see on the slide here, I'm telling you that it was published originally by the Kelmska Press. The Kelmska Press is important because it was founded by a friend of Ruskin's, and of course his name was William Morris. He was a fellow traveler with Ruskin. They believed in the idea of having unusual craftsmanship. This is the age of mechanization and things coming out from assembly lines, and they wanted nothing to do with that. They wanted things to be taken as if they were in medieval times. And William Morris founded the Kelmscott Press specifically to do limited edition books in the old illuminated style. Of course, illuminated manuscripts were done by hand by monks. There was no printing press invented at the time. So what William Morris did and what Ruskin did with him and that whole group was to create a new concept, which is the idea, and you see a page of one of the books here, the first page, a printed book coming off of a press, but very much in the style of an illuminated manuscript. And this came together artistically in a very particular style. We have a, a lovely example um, right here in Boston of Ruskinian Gothic, and you can see it here from a 19th century illustration. Luckily for us, this building still exists. Um, this is a photograph of it today. It is Memorial Hall at Harvard, and it takes everything that Ruskin believed, lots of color, lots of pattern, all kinds of different things going on, a jumble. This was also, of course, uh, meant to be demolished because it was considered an abomination of Victorian architecture by the middle of the 20th century. What it is, and still lusciously been restored, on the left, is a dining hall and on the right is a theater, Sanders Theater, and it's still very much a part of the Harvard campus today. I don't think you would have what I'm gonna show you next, which is another style called Richardsonian Romanesque without Ruskinian Gothic. Once again, shoulders, other people coming on top of those shoulders. This is designed by the Boston architect, Henry Hobson Richardson. This is Trinity Church in Boston. This is the only building in the United States the only church, I should say, in the United States that has been on the list of the 10 most important buildings in America that is compiled every year by the American Institute of Architects. And in this next slide, you'll see something I think that's even more amazing statistically, which is that the AIA, every year since 1885, has updated this list of the 10 most important buildings in America. And as you can imagine, those 10 buildings shift depending on styles and trends. This is the only building that has been on list every single year since 1885. This people come literally from all over the world to see Trinity Church in Boston. And I don't think we would have this wonderful style if it weren't for Ruskin. So a man who was a colossus in this whole movement was a Dutchman who immigrated to England. And you see him here before you, Lawrence Alma Tadema. He adopted a style of painting that was unique. He painted almost exclusively scenes from ancient Rome, ancient Greece, and ancient Egypt. And one of his most spectacular paintings, which you'll see in this next slide, 
is called The Roses of Heliogabalus. This is based on a true story of a Roman emperor whose name, of course, was Heliogabalus, and you can see him there where that yellow arrow is in the upper slightly right, um, who invited friends to a dinner party at the palace in Rome, and there was a false ceiling that they didn't know about, and on his signal, the guards pulled the ceiling back, the ceiling collapsed, and the people were smothered to death, that was the intention, by millions of rose petals. And Alma Tanema took this as the subject for this painting. And in this next slide, you'll see the incredible detail that Alma Tanema was famous for. He painted this in London in four months during the winter, and every week he had roses sent over from the French Riviera so that he could actually get every single petal painted perfectly. And we have to talk a little bit about Heliogabalus because he's not someone who's well known today. He became the emperor of Rome when he was 14. Um, Edward Gibbon, who wrote The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire, said that he was, quote, abandoned himself to the grossest pleasures and ungoverned fury. He alienated every part of Roman society and was assassinated at the age of 18, having ruled for four years. What a story. On a happier note, I can show you another painting by Amatanema, which is the finding of the baby Moses, um, which took him, I believe, almost five years to paint. And this one I'm going to use to illustrate how art and our perceptions of it and its value fluctuate. Alma Tadema was unusual for an artist in that he was hugely successful in his lifetime. And after his death, his reputation just sunk. So you can see this painting was commissioned for what would today be about $4 million. That's what the commissioner paid for it in 1904. It sold in 1935 for 861 pounds, about $1,500. 1942, 265 pounds. 1960, 252 pounds. In the 1960s, his art was considered so disgusting that there were museums in the UK who put ads and classifieds in newspapers and said to the general public, please come take this art. You can have it for free. Just take it away. And there were no takers. By 2005, this same painting sold in New York for 1.75 million, and in 2010, it sold for $36 million. So quite a life for a painting, and it shows you just how much what we value is based on people's perceptions and styles. One of the most important collectors of Alma Tadema in America was a New Yorker, Henry Markand, you see here, um, who was a banker. His family had a jewelry business. He became a major collector of European art. He was one of the founders of the Metropolitan Museum. He became the Met's second president. He paid in 1887 $800 for the first Vermeer to enter the United States, um, the very famous woman with a water jug, which not surprisingly, he donated to the Met where it still lives today. But his house that he had on Madison Avenue in New York City was a treasure trove. It's sadly been demolished, but this is a photograph of it, um, probably about 1890. And there's one specific room in that house that I want to tell you about, and that's the Greek music room. This is the only photograph that I'm aware of that exists of it. This was not surprisingly a room for music and for art. And there are two pieces of Alma Tadema's art in here. On the left, that red arrow, that's a painting. And on the right, a grand piano that was designed and painted by Alma Tadema. And I'm gonna talk about each of those in turn, starting with the painting, which is my personal favorite of Alma Tadema. It's called A Reading from Homer. It's in the Philadelphia Museum of Art today. And what you see here is what Alma Tadema excelled at more than any other painter probably in history, which was the painting of stone, specifically ancient marbles. He knew how these stones aged. He went an exam, we have photographs of him peering down looking at old stones and how the watermarks hit them. He also loved painting these beautiful Mediterranean skies and Mediterranean waters as you see here. But this is also, I think, a lovely subject matter. You, you have someone here who's actually telling a story from Homer to a very small but enraptured audience. And this is a surprisingly big painting. When you see it in Philadelphia today, it, it sort of wraps itself around you and pulls you in. So I said we talk about the piano as well. Um, this piano is pretty astonishing. It's Steinway. It has the names of Apollo and all the muses and laid on its lid. And it is considered the grandest grand piano ever made. Um, 
everything about it was done by Alma Tadema. Um, pretty astonishing. It's today in the Clark Art Institute in Williamstown, Massachusetts, which has a number of important Alma Tadema paintings as well. So those of, of you like me who can think back to candid camera days, you remember that. This guy here, Alan Funt, who founded the program. Well, interestingly enough, Alma Tadema was an obsession of, of Alan Funt. He had the largest collection in the world of Alma Tadema paintings. He discovered him when he was hugely unpopular, started buying him up for $100 here, $200 there, and did a whole room in his house, a Roman room, based on Alma Tadema's work. He owned both of these paintings you see here on the left that I talked to you about earlier. And he started increasing his purchases when he heard that Ruskin declared Alma Tadema to have been the worst painter of the 19th century. This all came in very handy when in 1972, everything that Fund owned except his paintings in his house was embezzled by his money manager. He then arranged a viewing of his entire collection of Alma Tadema's at the Met, which really raised their profile and thus their value. And he sold them in London for what would today be about $7 million, which enabled him to live comfortably for the rest of his life. And what I find most interesting is the two paintings that I talked to you about, the roses of Heliogabalus and the Moses there, they had been sold or been tried to sell just 13 years before this for 100 pounds and 250 pounds and no takers and they sold for 28,000 pounds and 30,000 pounds. So you can see what this one man did to sort of raise the profile of Alma Tadema. Something that probably very few of us are aware of is that Alma Tadema has had a huge influence on the movies. Every single one of these movies, Intolerance in 1916, the original Ben-Hur from 1925, the 1934 Cleopatra, and the 1956 Ten Commandments, all of these that we know for a fact that the set directors had images of Alma Tadema's art and they used those to create the sets. And in the Ten Commandments, we actually have photographs of Cecil B. DeMille with big blow-ups of Alma Tadema art, showing it to his set director, set designer, and saying, I want this, I want this look. An incredible influence, and the influence actually continues because if you can cast your mind back all the way to the year 2000, the movie Gladiator, a fantastic movie, we know that Ridley Scott, who is the force behind this movie, talked about the fact that Alma Tadema's art influenced his depiction of ancient Rome, the interiors and the exteriors, and particularly the exterior of the Colosseum in Rome, which you see here from an advertisement for um, the Gladiator movie. Look at this and then look at the famous painting that Alma Tadema did in 1896 of the Colosseum. And you can see exactly where Ridley Scott got his ideas from. And the thing that you see going on here with Alma Tadema is he didn't just paint old buildings, he made them as accurate as possible. The kinds of sculpture, those, those big vases there, all of that existed. And he was one of the very first people to properly research how the ancient Romans used where Ginevra's putting that arrow up there. Um, that's the structure to have great canvas to come in and shield part of the stadium from the sun. Um, he was very interested in the mechanics of how things work, not just for the beauty of them. Something else that London has given us is the Modern Museum. The National Gallery was founded in London in 1824 and the National Portrait Gallery in 1856. The National Gallery is important because it's the first museum in the world founded as a gallery for the people, meaning it was not as other European collections based on a prince or a king who had had a collection who had given it to the people or when it had been taken from the king and opened as a public museum. This is the first time that the idea of educating the masses through art had real traction. And the National Gallery started off with almost no collection and collected. Its goal in the beginning years was one masterpiece from every major painting school in history. The National Portrait Gallery is one of only four in the world. It was, of course, the first. The other ones are in Washington, in Edinburgh, and in Australia. And um, it's interesting that these are all Anglophone countries. So this idea of having um, a gallery of famous people from that country 
um, very much focused in the English speaking world. I have to say for years, I would go to the National Gallery and I would think, ugh, the National Portrait Gallery, I don't wanna see faces of people. Um, I was all about visual arts. Now I find the National Portrait Gallery possibly even more intriguing and interesting than the National Gallery because these are the people that you learn about that you see and you know through history books and there are actual portraits from life of them. So I think the most important person in 19th century London is this man, Charles Dickens. Uh, he was a colossus. He created so much of what we think of today as the modern world. And so much of that, like with Ruskin, is based in social equality. I'm sure everybody knows that his father was declared bankrupt and had to enter debtor's prison, which meant that his family, which had been relatively well-to-do, um, was poverty stricken. And Dickens himself had to work in a shoe blacking factory. This is a illustration that was done in 1892. And of course he was um, no longer a boy. Um, he wasn't even alive. But um, this shows you, he, he, this, this scarred him for life, this idea of a child who had to work and he worked very hard to put child labor laws into place in you know, 16, 18 hours a day. Um, his very first successful publication was in 1836, it was the Pickwick Papers. And what he did, which was pretty unusual at the time, was that these were not produced in book form, these were serials. So you had to buy the latest issue of the magazine or newspaper to read the next installment. And we have evidence all around the world, certainly here in Boston, of people waiting by the docks for the ships to come in so they could read the next story of what Dickens was writing about. That, of course, was followed in 1837 by Oliver Twist, Every one of these, of course, hugely successful. I don't think there's ever been anyone who's written stories in the English language the way that Dickens has. I think possibly the most influential of all his books was his 1843 A Christmas Carol, um, which in many ways helped to create our modern conception of Christmas. Um, in spite of many subsequent remakes with lots of money behind them, I think the most wonderful version of that was the 1951 that you see here with Alistair Sim as Scrooge. Um, they had almost no money, it was just after the war, and yet they produced a masterpiece. All of these things together lead us to what we think of today as modern Christmas. And um, you see this lovely illustration, which this fills my heart with warmth, The Night Before Christmas, 1985 illustration by an American artist called Scott Gustafson. Well, this couldn't have happened without two people. We already talked about one of them. That, of course, is Dickens. And the other one, believe it or not, was Prince Albert, the husband of Queen Victoria. He, of course, was German. And when he came and married her, he brought with him this tradition that was a German tradition of bringing in an evergreen tree at Christmas time into a house and decorating it. That was a new thing. And you see here um, the very first image published in the United States of a Christmas tree. This was from the 1850 Christmas edition of Godey's Ladies Book, which was published in Philadelphia. And they basically stole this image from the Illustrated London News from two years before in 1848. This was um, Queen Victoria and Prince Albert at Windsor Castle in front of their Christmas tree. They took off the tiara of the queen and because American men didn't wear mustaches the way the Brits did, they took the mustache off of Prince Albert and presented this as an American scene. So we can almost pretty much say that this illustration that you're looking at right here began the idea of the Christmas tree in America. If you talk to Dickens, he actually said he would be um, cornered by journalists and they would say, what's your favorite book that you've written? What character is most dear to you? And he would slyly smile and say, well, his name is David. And of course, that was David Copperfield that was published originally in 1849. And once again, in spite of many remakes, I think the seminal version of that is the MGM production of 1935 with W.C. Fields and Freddie Bartholomew as Micawber and David that you see here. There was a lovely 1999 uh, miniseries version that I think is worth mentioning because it had the divine Maggie Smith as Aunt Betsy, Betsy Trotwood. And for those of you who've traveled with me to England, you will recognize the house they use is Aunt Betsy's house, Houghton Lodge in Hampshire, where we had a lovely lunch on two different tours, actually. And this next photograph is an interior in that house with Aunt Betsy. And there, of course, is David himself with a red arrow next to him. 
he was not famous then. He has since become quite famous. This is him as an adult in a 2013 movie called Kill Your Darlings. Um, and you can probably guess from this um, handsome young man that he grew up into what made him really famous just after actually he made David Copperfield. And that of course was Harry Potter because he was Daniel Radcliffe. He is Daniel Radcliffe and an amazing actor who's really turned into a fantastic actor who doesn't chase after money. He's got a lot of it, but he does great stage productions. So I wanna end with um, a famous image that was done after Dickens' death, um, which is today in the Dickens House Museum in London, um, showing him sitting in his office, his chair where he wrote his stories. And these are all the characters that he created floating around him. I have to say, I reread Dickens over and over again, and I never, ever get tired of what he creates. The thrills, the stories, the humanity, the compassion. I mean, just an amazing man. Um, I like to think that Dickens had a cat. I don't know if he had a cat, but because I've ended all these lectures with a picture of my cat, this is Miles when he was three weeks old. Um, I know it's hard to imagine anything cuter in the world. And he is actually, as I speak, sleeping in my bed right now, completely oblivious. Um, so thank you all so very much for joining me today. Well, thank you, Kurt, for that fascinating presentation. Uh, before we get to your questions, I am very excited to announce that next month, um, October, I can't believe it's already October, uh, Kurt will be teaching a three-week online course on the art, architecture, and interiors of British country houses. Uh, this will be um, actually a two-part series, this first part happening in October and the second part happening, I believe, in February. This first part of the series will cover the medieval uh, Jacobean restoration and Baroque style, examining how each influenced uh, design and culture. And if you'd like to enroll in this program, please visit AmericanAncestors.org slash education slash online hyphen classes. And I will also include this information um, on the program in my follow-up email later today. All right, so let's get to your questions. If you have anything that you'd like to ask Kurt, uh, go ahead and type your query into the question panel and we'll answer as many as we can in the time provided. Um, so first of all, several people have agreed with you that um, that Brett, Jeremy Brett, is the quintessential <laughs> Sherlock Holmes. So um, you're amongst, uh, I guess, fans there. Um, Gary asks, was London a city of the Industrial Revolution, like the cities of, say, Birmingham, Manchester, and the Midlands, which is London considered kind of a city of the Industrial Revolution? Um, I would have to say no to that, um, because even though it was hugely polluted, it was not polluted in the way that those cities were. They were just disgusting. I mean, they were really hell holes of huge factories. London was, though it had to have some factories in the periphery, it was a city of commerce, meaning banking and insurance and art. So you didn't have the same kind of hopeless poverty um, in London that you did have in other cities, but it was still pretty damn bad. And Michael asks, um, what books on the history of London would you recommend? Oh my goodness gracious. Well, you know, I should have thought of that in advance. I'm looking as we speak actually at my bookshelf. Um, there are so many books on London, but there's one in particular that I can't find. Um, you know, with Jennifer, I will email you some books and you can send it out on the email to everybody else afterwards. There, there are so many books about, about London, but um, there's one just, just in the Thames itself, which is astonishing because it tells you the whole story of London through the river. Because of course, like every city of the ancient world and the modern world, you couldn't have a city without a, a river. And the Thames really made London. So if you guys um, can hold on a few minutes um, today or tomorrow, whenever Ginevra sends that email out, I will give her some book suggestions that you can buy on Amazon or used on abebooks.com. Thanks, Kurt. Um, and uh, Dennis asks, do you know if uh, Civilization, the series that you referenced, if that can be found on the web or how might you be able to view that? Well, I, I'm embarrassed to tell you, the answer is yes. I'm embarrassed to tell you that even though, as I said, I have the DVDs, I, I couldn't find them. <laughs> so um, I looked on YouTube and somebody, not officially, but somebody has put up all of the episodes on YouTube. Um, so if you type in civilization, you just type it with an S instead of a Z 
and um, type in Kenneth Clark, you can get the episodes. And um, the thing I have to say about them that, that I, I just can't get over is that I probably have seen them probably five times, all 13 episodes. Every time I learn something new, and it's not so much that I'm learning something new, it's just that in the intervening years between seeing it this time and the time I saw it before, I've learned something that makes what I'm looking at now, like, aha, now I understand that. That's so cool. His grasp and his ability to distill information down and his humanity is just amazing. Um, he's very much of a time and period. He's, he's a pompous upper-class Brit, but um, it, it, it's, it's just amazing the way he can put all this together. He can synthesize this and give you a sense. His whole idea is that civilization is everything and that um, in the last part of the 20th century, he died in the 1980s, um, that we were having a reaction against civilization. The whole idea that we were in a society that was opposed to civilization, um, which sadly we can say is probably continuing today. Uh, now, Amy says this has been fantastic, um, and several people have um, shared their comments. Uh, but she asks, can you talk or, you know, can you talk a little bit about the British Museum in relation to those other two galleries that you mentioned? So, uh, uh, the, of course, the National Gallery and the uh, Portrait Gallery. Yes. Well, so the British Museum also, well, actually, the British Museum was founded in the 18th century, so it's not a 19th century creation, So, which is why I didn't make it into this lecture. The building that it's in now is a 19th century building, but it started off in a townhouse in London. Um, the other thing is that the concept behind it was not unique. The National Gallery and the National Portrait Gallery, the ideas of those as a new kind of museum were new and they were developed in London in the 19th century. Whereas the British Museum was very much based on like the Louvre, um, which was originally a princely collection. So the concept behind a museum of all cultures had existed for a long time, mainly private cabinets of curiosities in European rulers. So it's not as groundbreaking um, as those two because it was following a path that had already existed. Um, and we also have a question about, um, let's see if I could find it again. So James asks, you know, how were other cities around the world, especially in Europe, trying to compete with London during this time? It was very difficult because um, Britain really did rule the world. I mean, there was something that they called it um, Pax Britannia, which is the peace of Britain. Um, the British Empire was so unchallenged militarily and so ubiquitous that it was very hard to compete um, against them, um, much to the chagrin of the French, of course. Um, uh, certainly they did, and America ultimately, of course, unseated Britain from that, that perch that it was on. Um, but I, you know, for most of the 19th century, Britain was pretty much unchallenged in almost every way. It wasn't until the end of the 19th century when Germany was unified that you had a real competitor coming up. And of course that resulted in World War I. Um, and Linda says, you know, I, I've read that there was a huge influx of population from the rural areas into the big cities, especially London, during the early 1800s. So going, you know, a little before the 19th century, but, um, or I guess the early 1800s. Um, any comments on that? How did that influx of uh, people into the city kind of affect city life? Well, it made it worse. I mean, when I said to you it was the first um, city in the world to be documented with a million or more inhabitants, um, they, they came for the same reason they did in America. They came to the cities after the Civil War, particularly in America, um, for jobs, for a better life. But don't forget, in the 19th century, the average Brit, regardless of where they lived in Great Britain, never traveled more than 50 miles from the place they were born in their entire lives. So it wasn't many people proportionally who came into the cities. Younger people like you see today in cities, younger people who have energy and can have nine roommates in New York, they're the ones who come and try to make a difference. The thing is, it was horrible living in the countryside unless you had a decent income. Um, you were either in service, meaning you worked in a big house and you got a half a day off a week. You got paid horrible wages. Um, you had, the only way you could really survive 
as a middle class or working class person was to have a bit of land and to farm it. And that was a decent income. You probably wouldn't leave that to go to the city. But if you didn't have that, if you came from the, the dregs, the bottom of society, you had nothing to lose. So you came into the city and that's where you had what cities have always done, which is vice and, and thievery and all kinds of um, prostitution. And of course, this is nothing new. We actually have first century AD writing from the, the equivalent of the mayor of Rome saying the same things. You can't go out after night because it's not safe. There are robbers everywhere. And there's the young people today don't have any respect for their elders. All of that is thousands of years old and cities have always had that appeal and always had that repulsion. All right, just a, a few more questions. There's so many great questions. Unfortunately, I don't think we're going to be able to get to all of them today, um, but just a few more before we say goodbye. Um, David asks, you know, were there any significant buildings that survived the Great Fire of London that were then rehabilitated uh, in the 19th century? Wow. Um, there were certainly buildings that survived the Great Fire. Um, I don't know if any of them, so the Great Fire was in 1666, let's put this in perspective. Um, I, I don't, I can't think of any building that would have been, been rebuilt hundreds of years later in the 19th century from the Great Fire. Um, I think you might be talking about the, fi the fire of the Houses of Parliament in 1834. That was not a great fire. I mean, it was a fire, but it didn't envelop all of London like the Great Fire of 1666 did. It was sort of more contained. And there were outbursts of fires all along. But don't forget, London was a very medieval city. Until the Great Fire in 1666, it was just basically yuck. Um, it was not the grand European cities like Paris. Um, it was very much a backwoods, disgusting, small little lane city. It was Christopher Wren, after the Great Fire, who created the beginning of the modern London that we see today. And of course, because the fire was so devastating, the new buildings were built in stone and bricks, so they're much less likely to burn. So I, that's a little bit of an answer to the question, but I don't think I'm completely sure exactly what you mean by rebuilding it in the 19th century. All right, and a final question. Several people are asking the image that's currently on our screen. Um, what is it? <laughs> Where is it? Tell us a little well, bit about this image. <laughs> I love to talk about anything to do with an English country house. This is a photograph I took um, of a house in Derbyshire, England called Kettleson Hall. This is called the Marble Hall. This is sort of the entrance hall of the house. The house is owned by the National Trust today. This to me is one of the most beautiful interiors in the world. And um, it's an astonishing recreation of ancient Rome by one of my favorite architects, Robert Adam, who designed this in the 1760s. All right, well, that's kind of a nice segue too, because um, as I mentioned at the start of this program, this presentation has been recorded, as have all of the webinars in this series, the Art and Architecture with Kurt DiCamillo webinar series. Um, and so we did have a presentation uh, that Kurt gave a few months ago on Ro Robert Adam. That presentation, as well as uh, this presentation, will be posted and is available on our website, as well as our YouTube channel. I will be sending a follow-up email with a link to that recording and to those past archived recordings. And also, if we didn't get to your question today, or if something um, kind of appears in your mind as you review those past recordings, you can always reach us at heritagetours at nehgs.org. So I want to thank you again for joining us today. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback. As we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings, any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. And this free webinar was made possible by the generous support of members and friends around the world. Please consider making a gift to American ancestors to keep these programs free and to create more programs for you and others to enjoy. If you'd like to learn more about American ancestors and the fabulous heritage tours, many of which are led by Kurt, please visit AmericanAncestors.org slash heritage hyphen tours. I will also include that, e that link in my email follow-up. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.